Uh, I work in a collective that's called the Laboratory of Insurrectionary Imagination. Uh, and I think the, the basis of what we do is to bring artists and activists together to create new forms of civil disobedience, partly because we see all history has been created through disobedience. Everything we take for granted, from women wearing trousers, to the right to a weekend, to, a, to being part of a union, all these things, to voting if we wish to do that, all these things happened because people disobeyed the laws. And we see that as fundamental. Uh, and we also think that art and activism together can make incredible new forms. So we reject representation. So for us, if we're going to do work around climate change and, and climate justice, we're not going to do something like put uh, icebergs, beautiful icebergs, in the streets of Paris to watch them melt. And this was during the COP. We would actually set up uh, a climate games uh, inspired by Grundfund in, in, in Amsterdam, a kind of activist game that uses the internet and real space. So that we would do that. We wouldn't represent the problem. We wouldn't show the problem of climate. We would actually do an action that would actually be direct and would actually try and change the situation. So this is one of the many climate games where people were uh, in uh, Volkswagen, went and did these very strange dances in the Volkswagen uh, in, uh, shops. Um, or we would organize, help organizing uh, with the Red Lines action, which was in December. Uh, so our work is actually organizing. It's not representing, it's transforming the world. For us, that is the role of art. And it's been the role of art since the beginning of the avant-garde 21st centuries, from Dada right through to situationism. This idea of the artist's role was to transform society, not to show it to people. And for us, that's the beautiful thing. And the most beautiful thing is to win. For us, we have to keep thinking about winning. That's where the aesthetic beauty comes, in that moment where we win something, where we actually create the world that we're wanting to create. But we'll come to winning later. Um, so we bring artists and activists together, often in a pedagogic way, often with workshops. The art artists you know, are, are trained to be creative, to be imaginative, to think outside of the box, and uh, unfortunately often have quite big egos. Activists, and I'm generalizing, are uh, trained to be uh, uh, more social, have more social critique, maybe have more uh, uh, engagement uh, with society, more radicality sometimes, but often not much imagination. So for us to bring these two, to, two together, we can actually create new forms. So the forms we've developed range from things like the uh, clandestine insurgent uh, rebel clown army, uh, a kind of global protest meme that, that, that spread. We were also the inventors and the first deserters, but that's a long story. Uh, we've, used barric we've used benches, uh, putting fake uh, signs on, on, on park benches. Uh, we've used simple things like snowballs. This was the great the, the snowball fight against the bankers where we had the people versus the bankers just after the crash in London in the financial district. We organized this snowball fight for the people against the bankers. We've used uh, ants. Uh, these are uh, raspberry strawberry ants that we actually injected into the banks that were fun funding fossil fuel. Uh, and these ants actually are attracted to, to electronics. They go into the computers and they cause short circuits and sabotage the computers. Uh, and we, we make tools for uh, such as these are the tools we made for the climate camp, uh, which are shields with uh, images of people who are affected by climate, the climate breakdown that protected us from moving through a police line and created kind of media images. Uh, we've used bikes. Uh, these bikes began in an art context at the Arnolfini Gallery in Bristol. Uh, many of them ended up in the hands of the Danish police, and then they ended up in the Victoria and Albert Museum, so a full circle. Um, but we've also uh, always, for us, the most important thing is we have one foot in the social movements, and we work in the social movements as organizers, such as the climate camp, and one foot in the cultural world. So, for example, last year we did, we've done quite a lot of work with the Berliner Festspiele in Germany. So always one foot in each, in each. And for us, that's super important. One foot in the ZAD, we're quite involved in liberated territory against an airport in France, and one foot in the, 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 the art world, uh, such as the, the show at the KV, KZW in, in, about global activism. At the root of what we do, I think, really is radical friendship. All our projects, we create, we create these tools, we create these actions and these moments, but actually, because we work horizontally, we try and work uh, with a, a kind of collective spirit, uh, and the key is 
creating friendships. Because for us, we think that that is the basis of any politics, is the trust and the friendship and the love that is created through those intense moments of working together in disobedience. And so we love this quote from Mujer Triendo, a, a kind of anarcho-feminist art group in Bolivia. The other thing we, we think is really key is that the left, and progressive groups, environmental groups, have a tendency to think that if only people knew the truth, things would change. If only people knew how many people are dying during this talk I'm giving because they don't have good water systems, then everyone's going to go out and do something. If only everyone knew that you know, 200 species were made extinct today, forever. We don't believe that people are moved by the truth. We believe that people are moved by desire. And capitalism knows this much better than artists, uh, much better than activists. Capitalism knows that it creates its own truths, cre creates its own desires. And as artists and activists, we have to create these desires. And we, particularly influenced by Stephen Duncan's work, a, a scholar and activist who was involved in Reclaim Streets New York, who says, politics is not solely or even primarily about reason, thinking, and rational choices. It's an affair of fantasy and desire. People are rarely moved to action, support, or even consent by realistic proposals. They're moved by dreams of what could be. So let's get to the subject, art washing. So art washing is this kind of magical sleight of hand that transforms progressive art into a tool for upholding the status quo. Or at least it tries to do that. So, tell a little story about a project uh, that the Laboratory of Insurrectionary Imagination uh, was invited to do. We were invited by the Tate Modern, <coughs> London's big contemporary art museum, to do a workshop around activism and art. And uh, they wanted it to be a two-day workshop, two different weekends, and they wanted, at the end of it, a, uh, an action. We called it Disobedience Makes History. They put it on the front page of their website. They were super proud. At one point, the curator said to me, oh, I'm so happy, we've got real activists in the Tate, at which point I wanted to vomit. Um, and they also said, you know, but the point of activism is to disrupt things. And I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then they sent us this email. So they sent us this email a few days before, uh, going, you know, we've sorted out the room, uh, the tea, the coffee, etc. And, oh yeah, ultimately it's also important to be aware that we cannot host any activism directed against Tate and its sponsors. However, we very much welcome and encourage a debate and a reflection on the relationship between art and activism. Well, this was the best pedagogic material anyone had ever given us. So, who are the sponsors of the Tate? Well, it's not uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger, uh, it's not Tony Blair, although he's pretty responsible. It's British Petroleum, and this is uh, uh, John Brown, the CEO of British Petroleum, and also the head of the trustees of the Tate for a very, very long time. So, like in many cities in Europe, the oil companies are basically involved in funding nearly all the cultural institutions in London, either Shell or BP. Now, why do they fund culture? They don't do it because they want people to buy pre petrol. You know, adverts from the mid of the last century were really very much geared to getting people to buy the brand of petrol. And these days we don't see these adverts to get people to buy petrol. People buy petrol anyway. What they do, the reason they fund these institutions is what's called a social license to operate. To get petrol out of the ground, to pump it to a refinery, to pump it into the petrol stations or the factories, you need to basically get the support of the population all the way along the line. You need the support of the population where you're pulling it out of the ground, especially as you're likely to cause a war there and likely to destroy the environment there. And you're going to need it in the areas where the, the, the funding to make all that happen happens, such as London or Amsterdam, where the money is to enable this to happen. And so, they fund these museums because it's there that the dip diplomats, the foreign office, people working in the foreign offices, the embassies, the elite go. They go to these museums and they need to be convinced that it's okay to do this work. So basically, art washing is a kind of detergent. It's a kind of special detergent which makes you forget that oil causes wars 
that makes us forget the non-human effects of the oil industry. That makes us forget that actually most scientists are saying that actually if we continue to burn the fossil fuels and pump them out of the ground, we're going to have a planet with a, temp with a, a temperature similar to Mars, which is pretty similar to hell, and that actually we will have a planet which is inhospitable to human life. It's a, it's a, it's a special mask that washes away the fact that 100 million people will die due to climate change in the next 17 years. It's a special kind of detergent that makes us forget the fact that actually it was climate and therefore the pulling out of fossil fuels out of the ground and burning them that caused the droughts in Syria, that causes the wars in Syria, that causing the, the refugee crisis. And so when we burn the geology of Iraq or Kuwait or the Gulf of Mexico, when we burn that geology, we make the rain stop in Syria. Before oil companies, we had cigarette companies, tobacco companies. A lot of art and culture was sponsored by tobacco companies. That now is seen as socially unacceptable. And what we are going towards now is another phase where we're beginning to see it as socially unacceptable that oil companies are funding culture. And one day we will see oil companies as the same way that we now look at slave trade companies. We'll look at them in the same way. Maybe our children win, will, for sure. So let's get back to the tape. So they sent us this email. We started the workshop. We, held, uh, we taught people how to do consensus decision making, which we always do at the beginning of our workshops. We got them to do drawings around the experience of disobedience. There's about 40 people there. And then I gave a little talk, and I projected the email onto the wall. Now remember, the title of the workshop is Disobedience Makes History. So this was perfect. So I, we projected it, and we said, OK, this is what the Tate has said. Now, the curator who wrote it was in the room. I didn't point her out. I just said, the Tate is asking us to do this. Said, you know, ultimately, it's important to be aware that we cannot host any activism direct against the Tate and its sponsors. However, we very much welcome and encourage a debate and reflection on the relationship between art and activism. Are we going to obey this or not? And we did a, a spectrum line that Selch will show us after this, but where you basically see yes and no, and you get people, you ask the question, you get people to stand on the line. So are you going to disobey or obey? Perfect workshop material, because it was real. It wasn't some kind of abstract academic question. It was a real question. Caused a massive dis discussion, debate. People got really upset, got really excited. The curator started to freak out. Um, <laughs> And then uh, we basically um, uh, stopped the work, ended the work, the first day of the workshop, and the students were, yes, we're going to do an action. I get a phone call, and I'm, uh, Mr. Jordan, will you come and meet us, please? And uh, I have to meet the head of security, head of public relations, head of publics, two other curators, you know, big, big board of people. And they're like, you can't do an action. And I'm like, well, you know, uh, you've, you can see what the students are talking about on the, on, on the website, you know, that's what they're discussing. And they're like, oh, yeah, yeah, we saw. Some of them say that you're going to walk around, it was a stupid idea, but some of them say you're going to walk around with sellotape on your mouth. That's going to scare the children. I'm like, have you seen your collection and that, you know, the Svankmeyer uh, uh, animations and stuff? I mean, that's going to scare children. What are you, talking about? are you bringing children into it? And then they're like, no, you can't do the action. If you do the action, BP will, not, will, will stop their funding, and then we'll have to charge people to see contemporary art. And I'm like, so you're censoring us? And they're like, no, that's a very emotive word to use, Mr. Jordan. Anyway, it was a great moment, because as the Zapatistas say, we're, we are already dead, therefore you cannot kill us. And at that moment, we felt like that. We didn't want anything from the Tate. We don't care if we're not invited back again. And they never had to deal with an artist who, who did that. And so we were already dead. We could do what the fuck we wanted. And we did. The students did a very, very basic action because the Tate said they were going to please the workshop. They would close it down if we tried to do an action. So it was pretty heated moments. And the students just did this very simple thing on the top of the Tate, which said art, not oil, at the end. But they set up a group called Liberate Tate from the workshop. And luckily, and unfortunately not luckily, but 90 days later, the deep water horizon started to spill 3.19 million barrels of oil into the Gulf of Mexico, having a massive effect on non-human and human life. So the first action of Liberate Tate was to go in on the... They were having a Tate birthday party. So we went into the Tate birthday party with a lot of black balloons, and attached to the black balloons were uh, fake dead birds and real dead fish. And we let the balloons up onto the top of the uh, uh, turbine hall 
hoping that the dead fish would stay there and smell for a very long time. Uh, they then they had to bring someone in with a gun and shoot the balloons down. And then a, f a few weeks later, uh, BP decided to celebrate 20 years of BP sponsorship with the Tate, with a big opening party with champagne and everything. So we came to celebrate with them, and we poured a lot of molasses all around the Tate. Uh, and then two activists were in, artist activists were inside the Tate with molasses hidden under their dresses, and they started to uh, they pierced the thing, and the molasses started to go all inside the museum. And then they were using their high-heeled shoes and picking up it up and trying to clean it and saying. It's a very, very, very little, big gallery and a little spill, which is exactly what the head of BP said after the Gulf of Mexico. He said, it's a big, big sea, it's a very little spill. It managed to get huge media, international media, and start really the debate around fossil fuels and culture in the UK. So and I just want to look at 15 principles for effective, beautiful trouble, using the actions that Liberate Tate did from that moment onwards. The first one is abandon your cultural capital. What does this mean? Well, as artists, and there are many artists in this room, you know, we are taught to, have, to construct this cultural capital uh, and build it and so that we get shows and, and so on. Now, if you're doing this kind of work in the museums and the institutions where you want to get shows, you're not going to do good work if you're still holding on to your cultural capital. So we will never get a retrospective in the Tate. We will never be reinvited in the Tate. That's fine, because for us, the work is about the politics, not about the ego and so on. So, number one, be prepared to destroy your own cultural capital. But you gain a lot of fucking friends and a lot of media and a lot of other kind of cultural capital. Keep going and never give up, number two. That's the key with Liberate Tate, is they just kept going and kept going. They never went home. Institutions can deal with one action. The key is to keep on the attack, to keep going back and returning again and again until you win. In a way, this was the most important principle of Liberate Tate. And they went back and back. They, in six years, they did about 17 unsanctioned performances in the museum, ranging from materials using, using doing this sunflower thing where they stood on these, these little things of, of oil, uh, to more complex things where they commissioned three sound artists to do an alternative sound audio tour around the museum, uh, talking about oil, sponsorship, and so on, uh, to uh, on the third anniversary of the Gulf of Mexico, uh, they basically did a performance that lasted several days uh, where they were whispering extracts of all the court transcripts uh, from the, BP, the trial of BP against about the um, Deepwater Horizon. So keep going, use different materials, different uh, uh, forms. Oh, my numbering's gone a bit fucked here, sorry. Uh, I'm dyslexic, that's okay. Um, least effort for greatest effect. This is key, especially if you want to keep going. If you're doing really big, heavy projects that just tire everyone out, you're not going to be able to keep going. We learn from permaculture, we learn from ecosystems. Ecosystems are incredibly good at uh, uh, saving energy. That's why nature works so well, because it actually say, constantly saves energy, the opposite of capitalism, in a sense. Uh, and so to keep the stamina going and so on, do actions which have a massive effect, but use very, very little energy. One of the most beautiful ones was human cost on the first anniversary of the Deep Horizon spill, where three people went in. Uh, it cost 30 euros, this action, uh, the co which was the cost of these plastic things and, uh, and something else, I can't remember what it was. Uh, it got loads of media, got three and a half minutes on, on the news, and it got the front page of the Financial Times. Choose a tactic that supports your strategy. This is really key. Often people, especially artists, and I'm really very responsible for this kind of stuff, often we, we're, we're so obsessed by form that we forget actually the more narrative, political campaigning strategies. We're just thinking about the tactics all the time. Now, it's super important to evolve the tactics and so on. But if those tactics don't, aren't linked up with what actually you want to do with the campaign, the strategy, then it, it's kind of pointless. So the, the, the tactics here were very clear. The strategy was get BP out of the Tate and use artistic performative forms to do that. So it involved uh, networking with other artists. This is Reverend Billy. He did one of, one of the performances. Uh, it involved uh, using fame and names a bit. So there were lots of letters written where key figures in the art world were invited to sign, sign letters, uh, which were then published in major newspapers. 
It used legal uh, stuff. So uh, especially if, um, we have freedom of information in, in, in the UK. The Tate kept refusing to tell us how much money they got. And we basically pushed them in these court for years. It took, I think, four years to get the information out of them. In the end, it was nothing. It was 200,000 euros. It's fucking nothing compared with the budget of the Tate. So it was not about the funding. It was about the social license to operate. It was about the elite. It was about the fact that it wasn't a museum. It was a wing of the PR industry, and it was the cheapest PR that BP has ever been able to get. Uh, Liberate Tate also did publications, really nice series of publications. This was one called Culture Beyond Oil. So those were all the different kind of tactics for the strategy. But the key aim of that strategy was to damage the reputation of Tate. In the Tate's funding policy, it says to refuse funding if it materially damages the reputation of Tate. So the key is how do you damage the reputation of that institution so that they pull the funding. Number four, know your cultural terrain. Uh, to do something well, as John Berger beautifully said, you have to know it. To improve something, you really need to know the texture, the life story of that thing. An artist is really good at knowing the life story of a thing. The best material, the best, the, the best artwork is made when someone knows their material, whether it's the body or wood or whatever. So what is the thing that one's working with? Well, one's working with an art museum. So an art museum has an art audience. It has its artist, Jeremy Della, who was you know, Britain's great political artist, also on the Tate board, refused to make any public statement ever about BP. Uh, and its wonderful uh, head of the Tate, the curator, Nicholas Sorota. So these were the kind of, this was the material to work with. This was the audience. And what do they like? They like aesthetics. And what are activists often bad at? Aesthetics. You know, activists do activism a really bad name by really bad aesthetics so often. <laughs> I mean, you know, stop. No. You know, even Art Not Oil, one of the, the kind of, the, 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 the seedbed from which Liberate Tate grew uh, before the workshop and so on, there was a group called Art Not Oil, did some great work but never really got any wins because they didn't really have very good aesthetics. So, you know, the, know your terrain. The terrain here was people who had really strong aesthetics and they were only going to listen to you if you had good aesthetics. Key to being good aesthetics, don't dress like a protester. So, uh, uh, Liberate Tate developed this whole uh, kind of uh, costume, uh, which was this black veil and dressing in black. And it became a kind of brand uh, and was also nice because it made, meant people were kind of anonymous, but it, you know, it wasn't like bringing the black block in. Um, and apply aesthetic discipline always. You know, don't be scared of, you know, often with activists it's pretty hard because they'll be going, oh yeah, yeah, we haven't got time. And there's actually, in, in my work, it's really hard because actually I think there's art time and activist time. You can, as an artist, you can spend a year doing a research project and in the end you do a performance that lasts two minutes and you eat a tulip and everyone's happy. Yeah, in activist world, there's constant pressure. You know, people are dying now. You know, the climate is fucking, we've got 10 years to stop this problem. So there's this constant urgency. And sometimes these two things are very, very difficult to find a, a, a balance. And it's a balance between that urgency and the necessity to make something really well. Dream, plan, and rehearse. Now, some of the best, best, best uh, actions that we now know of were planned and rehearsed. Now, this, the lunch sittings during the civil rights movements in the 50s and 60s in the US, movements that won incredible victories very, very quickly. One of the reasons is they really thought about their tactics and their strategies. And things like these, these lunch sittings, so they went into these bars where the black people and white people weren't allowed in the same bar. They sat and, and served themselves, and then they got attacked by basically white people. And this, this is a photograph of their rehearsal. They rehearsed, so they rehearsed with people s putting smoke into their faces to know what it would feel like because they knew this would happen. They didn't realize that people were gonna stab cigarettes into their faces. That they had, hadn't rehearsed on. But they rehearsed and they rehearsed their role playing and what it would, you know, how they would. And so they were ready. 
when the action happened, they were totally ready for what to do. So in Liberate Tate, we did loads of rehearsals. This was rehearsing one thing. We made little maps of the Tate. We worked out where it went. There was lots of rehearsal and lots of planning. Number seven, shift the spectrum of allies. So there's, in the spectrum of allies, there's four main things. There's people who are neutral, who don't really care about the issue. There's passive allies, people who agree, you know, the bourgeois intelligentsia, but they're not going to really fucking do anything about it. And then you've got your active allies, your activists. You've also got your passive opposition, people who, you know, they don't care. Uh, uh, they, 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 they think it's fine for them to be fossil fuels funding art, but they're not going to do anything about it. And you've got your active opposition. You've got your PR companies and so on who are going to do all the most they can to delegitimize your, your cause and so on. Now, often we think that you've got to go from, you know, from the active allies right to here. But actually, sometimes it's much, much more interesting to shift the spectrum just one notch to actually work with the, 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 the passive allies rather, or the passive opposition rather than go all the way along the spectrum. Number eight, do the mainstream media work for them? So often, journalists are lazy. So it's really good to have everything prepared so they can do the least work possible and you can get the most control about the message they're getting out there. There was a rehang of, in the Tate Britain. It was the BP British Art BP rehang. So they rehung the whole exhibition. Uh, and just uh, as it opened, uh, they, Liberate Tate did an action and they produced this really beautiful video, which I'll just show, to show, and this video was put on lots of media websites, so the work was already there. They didn't really have to do anything. So they're reading the parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere, and as it goes up every decade. And is this kind of threshold state which a lot of scientists say we, we absolutely cannot go over and which we went over last year, a couple of years ago. So the other thing is nine, hack their laws. Look at the law and see how you can hack their law. Now there's a law in Britain which is that if you find your grandma's a painting in your grandma's attic or whatever, this guy found this Picasso, like a bugger. Um, uh, if you find a, a painting, you can take it to the a museum and they have to accept it and decide whether they want to keep it for their collection or not. It's like a law in Britain. It's called the gift to the nation. So we thought, well, we'll take them up on their law. So we found this wind turbine, 16.5 metre long wind turbine, and 100 people uh, gave it to the tape and left it there and said, this is a, an artwork, we found it. Uh, it's an artwork about the future. You should keep it. Uh, and at the same time got the Tate members, so there's a kind of Tate members board, to uh, got a thousand members to write to the Tate saying you should keep this as a work of art. Uh, they didn't keep it, um, and, uh, but they did keep the documentation, interesting enough, in their archives, which one day I'm sure we'll see on the wall one day. <laughs> Escalate strategically. So it's very key in a campaign to, to think about it like a theatre work. Think about it with characters, think about it with costumes. Think about it with dynamics. Think about it with timing. How does it build? How do you get to that moment of conflict? Don't rush in too fast. And so uh, last year, just before the COP21 UN conference, they liberate, they escalated and did a piece uh, where they had uh, 75 people 
writing non-stop for uh, a whole, they, looked, they started on the 13th of June, ended on the 14th of June, and, went and followed the tide. So the river is right next to the Tate, and they basically followed the tide uh, along the, so writing and then going along like this. And it was really beautiful. Uh, and they stayed there two, a whole night. So that was escalating. That was really saying, like, you know, you're going to have to get us out now. We're not just doing a performance that lasts 20 minutes. We're doing a performance that lasts a whole day. We're going to be over there overnight when the museum is closed. So you're going to have to deal with us. So escalating strategically. And again, aesthetic discipline. Look at that. Black sleeping bags. Beautiful. No one wants to watch a drum circle. People want to participate. So again, when you're doing, thinking of your action, think of actions where people can actually participate in them. Hidden figures was a reference to the fact that uh, the Tate refused to give us information about how much money they were getting from BP. So we took them back again to court after the Freedom of Information Act. And in April 2014, the UK commissioner said, Tate is acting illegally. They should tell you how much uh, that you're getting. So this action was done, which happened to be at the same time as there was a Malevich uh, exhibition. Um, but it was clearly a reference to the fact that when we got these Freedom of Information things, we got these... These were the notes from their meetings, and then whenever it mentioned BP, it was like, boom, boom. oh, right, we couldn't read it. But then we forced them to show us that. And it was a beautiful action because it wasn't drum circle. Kids loved it, tourists and so on got involved in it. Never forget the power of the unexpected. If anything, the unexpected is our best tool. I mean, what more unexpected than setting up a tattoo parlor in, un, in again, illegally, unannounced, setting up a tattoo parlor in the Tate uh, Britain and actually tattooing uh, the PPMs onto people from their birth. So looking at when people were born and tattooing the parts per million of their, their date of birth. So the older you were, the more parts per million you had. Um, less. Huh? Uh, less. Yes. Sorry, dyslexia again. Um, stay on the edges. In ecosystems, it's the edge which has the most power. So the edge between the river and a bank or the sea and, and the shore or the edge where the forest becomes a meadow. It's there that you have the most number of species. It's there that you have the most number of relationships between species. And therefore, you have more evolutionary energy and more creativity. So what worked with Liberate Tate is they were on this edge between art and activism. Because they used all the language of art. This is their website. So whenever they did an action, they would put it as if it was an artwork, you know, with the material, bodies, veils, da -da -da, brown envelopes. They would use the language of art. They used the aesthetics of art. And yet it was activism. They were doing it illegally, but it was in the museum. So for the Tate, they were in this classic thing of put your target in a decision dilemma. So you must put your target so that your target doesn't know what to do with you. So of course, if they were kind of just activists going in, the Tate, it would probably be quite easy for them to bring the police in and get them out and so on. But, you know, what would the audiences who came to the museum think if suddenly they saw his security guard stopping this really beautiful performance happening in an art gallery? So that kind of, you know, space between art and activism, absolutely key. And finally, maybe the most important principle is aim to win. Aim to win. You're doing this because you're going to win, and you want to win, and everything you do is going to lead towards that winning. And so on the 11th of March 2016, Tate announced that BP, their BP sponsorship would end. No one expected it at that moment. They announced it. Liberate Tate did a kind of statement. But the, the key thing for about the edge thing was we did this together. We did this with art. We did this as art. And so it was really this edge between art and activism that was beautifully held by Liberate Tate. And they ended by, they'd actually found out that there's a little door at the top of the turbine hall that you can get access to. And, and they managed to get someone up there. And the last thing that Liberate Tate ever did was to throw 10 kilos of black uh, confetti out of this door uh, onto this kind of party that they're having downstairs to celebrate. And I think we're in a moment now, which is a really key moment. I think there is an energy behind divestment of all sorts. You know, the Rockefellers just divested from oil last year. BP's, uh, Tate's divested from BP. There's a role going on now. And I think it will be a role that will help us create what I think is how art will, 
hopefully be in the future inspired by Alan Capra, who says, we may see the overall meaning of art change profoundly, from being an end to being a means, from holding out a promise of perfection in some other realm to demonstrating a way of living meaningfully in this one. Thanks.